Many of you are here at the museum for the first time tonight, and as a result, you may be asking yourselves the question a lot of people do ask when they come to the museum or when they even hear about us for the first time, which is, why does a museum like this exist? An institution dedicated to telling the history of computing and its ongoing impact on society. Well, you heard a number of interesting people talking about them a minute ago, so consider this. At the turn of the 20th century, arguably the leading technology brand in the world was Western Union. It was formed in 1851 by a small businessman in Rochester, New York. It grew four years later as a result of a merger with a competitor. By 1860, its lines barely stretched to the Mississippi River. Its market capitalization was about a half a million dollars. In just 40 years, by 1900, Western Union was operating a million miles of telegraph lines. It dominated the two major intercontinental cables to Europe and West Asia. It had given birth to the first stock ticker, the first time service, the first money transfer service, the first charge card for its customers. It was a founding stock in the Dow Jones transportation average. Its market capitalization was $125 million. It was making 40% profit and carrying 60 million messages a year. It was, in short, one of the largest, most far-flung, most profitable technology companies ever in history up to that time, and hugely innovative for its day. But it turns out that innovation alone is not enough. History, the history of technology, the history of computing is replete with that lesson. Western Union is one kind of lesson. IBM, fortunately, is quite another. This, at least in part, is what the Computer History Museum is all about. It's about connecting the past to the future through the stories and objects that bring these lessons vividly to life. The risk, the rewards, the problems solved, and yes, even the failures. But most of all, we seek to be about the enormous progress and the vast social change that computing has brought to the world and, and the stories of the men and women who brought that change and are bringing it right through to today. We are therefore honored tonight to be included in the observance of a remarkable milestone, the IBM Centennial. It is not just remarkable to have IBM be celebrating 100 years as a company. To those of us in the history business, it is equally remarkable and wonderful that IBM is taking much of the year to reflect on and celebrate its legacy as a game changer again and again in a field where changing the game successfully is incredibly hard to do even once. Much of that legacy is down to its leadership. The DNA of Thomas J. Watson Sr. and Thomas J. Watson Jr. are, of course, deeply ingrained in the company. But it takes an equally unique kind of leader to steer battleship IBM relentlessly toward the future, on the one hand, and simultaneously direct at least part of its corporate attention into a year-long meditation on IBM's past and the meaning of that past. We hear it all the time in Silicon Valley. No matter how much past we may have as a company, we have a hell of a lot more future. So why has Sam Palmisano done this? What has it meant to IBM? What does it say about IBM? The way it thinks, the things it values. And why is that important to tie that past to a bright future? Tonight we get a glimpse into his thinking on these issues, as well as a personal celebration for the company he joined as a salesman in 1973 and has led since 2000. Please join me in welcoming the Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of IBM, Sam Palmasano. John, thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on the history, although we are at a museum, because I'm already old enough without acting old. So I think I should, if I'm in the Valley, I need to act a little more young and inspirational. But I do think there are a lot of lessons that you, we all can learn from a company that made it 100 years. You see it in the museum, in the revolution. I, uh, we were walking around. I mean, it, it, it does date you when you were trained on those products, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> you, know, you, you demoed the buffered key punch and the 083 sorter, and you supported the 1400s because I was in a public sector account. And in government, nothing ever goes away, you know, right? Uh, <laughs> The only reason they got rid of the 1400s is because we had a flood. This is a true story. The data center flooded, 
and they realized we really couldn't rebuild the machine. They might as well upgrade to, say, a 360, you know, right? <laughs> Even though we were selling 370s at the time. So um, some things do remain the same, even though time passes. Um, but so it's really, it's really special for, for me to be here. I was catching up with my old friend Andy Grove a second ago, and we were reminiscing of the PC business at the time, and he asked me if I missed it. And, I said, I don't miss the financial aspects of the PC business, but I do miss the excitement and the adrenaline rush of all uh, the product cycles and the speed of innovation and engineering. But I, like I said, the financial world is much better today for IBM without it. Um, which, and I'll talk about that uh, more as I go through kind of IBM. And as uh, John alluded to, we've been thinking a lot about our role, our history. We've been in discussions around the world uh, with government leaders all over the place this year. I've been in many lecture series and universities, uh, pretty much you can name whether it's Qingdao or IIT or to Tokyo University, et cetera, as well as the ones you'd expect in the United States. Um, and it, it's quite interesting, the observations. I also, I think I'd share with you some reflections I think that are uniquely appropriate to Silicon Valley where so much of our industry was shaped and where IBM has uh, had such a presence here, uh, and a long established presence. You might know, it, know this, but we actually started in Silicon Valley in 1943. We had offices in downtown San Jose on Notre Dame Street. And of course, you know, our laboratory is still here today, uh, Silicon Valley Laboratory in Albany. We have 4,000 engineers, scientists, and sales and service people in the valley. I just left Almaden this afternoon and saw some phenomenal things. And right now, it's, a, it's research, as we say. But, but nonetheless, uh, it's really, I think it's, it's great for us to be here. And it really is, I think, you might find it interesting, uh, the implications of 100 years. Um, and what we've tried to do this year is to share with people the experiences of a company that's made it 100 years, especially in technology. A former colleague of mine now who's teaching at Harvard sent me this study that Harvard had done on, they looked at six million companies, and only 1% made it 40 years. So you can imagine how rare it is for anyone to make it 100 a, a years. Uh, but it, you do have to think back to the Watsons, as, as John alluded to, and Junior, Tom Watson Junior, uh, we always refer to him as Junior, he was the chairman's son, the founder, and he stood before a lecture at Columbia University addressing an audience of future leaders. When IBM had turned 50, and Tom was invited to share his thoughts on what it meant to have a company that was a half century old and what it taught uh, IBM at that point in time. Uh, he began with a striking statistic, which was this. Of the top 25 industrial corporations in the United States in 1900, only two remained on that list in 1961. One of those because it absorbed six others on the original list Two companies had disappeared, and the remaining 15 had slipped far behind. Uh, and as he said, figures like this help remind us all that corporations are expendable, and that success, at best, is an achievement which always can slip out of hand. As 50 years ago, today he made that comment, so here we are now, 100 years at IBM, celebrating our centennial. So what has a hundred years taught us. Well, one thing that taught us is Tom was right. Success is fleeting. Of the top 25 companies on the Fortune 500 of the time of Watson's lecture, only six remain in 2010. Remain in 2010. This ruthless march uh, is very, very true and especially true in technology. Consider the companies that have defined the industry over the past century. The mainframe, the mini computer, the PC, the internet eras, and all those firms that today who define those eras that are gone or been absorbed. Burroughs, Univac, DEC, Data General, Wang, Prime, Compaq, Sun, Silicon Graphics, Tandem, Apollo, and the list goes on and on. So, but I think you know, people who are struck by the longevity uh, realize uh, that, you know, the fact that IBM has really continually changed in, as in revolution. I began, IBM began by making punch card tabulators, which you saw downstairs, which uh, 
which you didn't see down there, which you might not be aware of. IBM also made clocks and cheese slicers. And in 1914, we had one heck of a cheese slicer. I can tell you that right now. We're all class. Uh, nobody can slice Chardonnay like IBM. Uh, but, but, or blue cheese, I should have said, right? But big blue and blue cheese. We could slice up that blue cheese. But, you know, obviously, uh, that was the early days. And there's been just a whirl of in interventions, inventions since then. Typewriters, vacuum tube calculators, magnetic type. The first disk drive, memory trip, four-chan fractals, ATMs, mainframes, mini computers, personal computers, supercomputers, services, software, analytics. And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and those innovations have been chronicled here in this wonderful museum. We began, we operated in one country. Today we operate in more than 170 countries. Uh, and some people might say, like, you know, wow, you know, you haven't done the same thing, you know, for 100 years. And I always say that's one way of looking at it. But another view is we've been doing the exact same thing for a century. And I'd like to offer you what I think the lesson is of that century, the exact same thing. Uh, to put it very simply, this enterprise has always moved to the future. Continual forward movement, in fact, is inherent in the IBM value proposition. It's our business model. Uh, the frontier of what is truly innovative, innovative keeps moving. And you got to move with it. You can't sit still. If you sit still, the, especially in technology, the ramifications are disastrous. It's a constant reminder that you never should define yourself, or we never defined ourselves, no matter how successful we were by a product or by a business model. Uh, there are lessons in that, and I can give you, I'll give you the pros and the cons of doing that. But time has taught us how essential this balance is between what changes and what endures, how it can go wrong, and how we have to continually revisit and recontextualize the company for future generations. You know, we've thought about many dimensions of this balance between change and continuity this year. We've reflected on it. I've studied it. I've read most of Watson's writings over the years now. Uh, and I'd like to share with you, I think, three essential areas that are relevant to the Valley and to our industry. There are others, but I think for this audience tonight, I picked these three. The first, the importance of the N-N-R-N-D. I'll repeat that. The importance of N-N-R-N-D. Uh, we talk about R&D, and sometimes we forget that they're different. As revolution reminds us, our industry depends on advances in basic science. Indeed, you could say that the fundamental purpose of information technology industry is to create economic value from the discoveries of science. We see this again and again at the museum here. Uh, truly big breakthroughs in IT came from deep research. Bell Labs, Xerox PARC, IBM, universities like MIT and Stanford, obviously, as well as Lawrence Livermore. Uh, you have created an inspiring record of all that in this wonderful, wonderful world, in this age of industrial scientific research, built by institutions that pushed the boundaries of knowledge and that stuck to it in good times and in bad. Of course, not every technology innovator needs to be Xerox PARC or Livermore or IBM Research. Maybe you don't create a large-scale lab devoted to fundamental research Maybe you work primarily through collaborations and with others, governments, universities. But, but no matter uh, where individual companies locate their contribution to creating new value, our industry has a responsibility to contribute to the advance of science. Of course, that brings challenges. There are many challenges in pursuing advances in science. We all know that. Patents, breakthroughs commercializing those, and yes, in many cases, societal reaction, depending upon where those breakthroughs are occurring. It takes a kind of institutional patience, because the payoff from fundamental research usually doesn't show up in a quarter or a year, and sometimes a decade, and sometimes it never comes at all. Not only that, but there are constant pressures on this kind of a commitment, and they're very, very real, and they can never be shortchanged. Shareholder expectations for higher returns don't diminish when the economy stutters. In these moments, the temptation is strongest to cut 
investments and skills in R&D, and we've seen that more and more recently here in the Valley, and there are lots of recent examples that you could cite where in difficult economic times or making short-term financial commitments to Wall Street, those skills were cut. But yet, Tom Watson Sr. actually increased research investment during the Great Depression, and his son bet the business on the System 360, a bold move that's chronicled here at the museum. Uh, when he decided, the son decided to push this new model into the advanced computing at its time, nothing in the technology existed. IBM spent $5 billion in 1960 on System 360. $35 billion in today's dollars. $35 billion on a technology that didn't exist. And it was going to cannibalize all that unit record equipment you saw downstairs. And when he was asked the question, how could you do that, uh, the son answered, I believe there wasn't anything IBM scientists couldn't do. And he made a huge bet. Uh, but the same bedrock belief in scientific discovery continues today. IBM scientists in our nine research labs and dozen development labs around the world, including here in the Valley uh, at Almaden, are exploring further resources in nanotechnology, computational biology, genomics, deep analytics, modeling of disease, and on and on and on. So you saw one of these manifestations uh, last February when a system named Watson defeated two of the all-time great champions in the game of Jeopardy. Uh, the project was a concerted effort. It took 25 researchers, serious researchers, four years. Uh, there was no guarantee of payoff. Now, to be honest with you, we didn't do this for a game show. We, do, we did it to demonstrate natural language as an interface to a machine. We've struggled in this industry for years for changing the interface to natural language, more like a human experience as well as for deep, deep analytics and Q&A, which we think holds enormous promise as you look out to the future in fields of medicine and government and banking and on and on and on. Uh, you know, I would tell you that, you know, if you think about CEOs, I mean, my own reflective instinct in tough times is to look at R&D. I mean, we had a tough economic environment the past couple of years. We spend on average six to six, five, six point five billion a year in research and development, and we didn't cut it. Although it's easy, it's easy to think about it, and there are a lot of people in your finance organization encouraging you to do so, because it's going to be the toughest year we've had probably in a half a century, and we didn't do it. Because the reason we didn't do it is you can't catch up. You just can't catch up in this game. And oh, by the way, we didn't cut R&D. In 2008, we had the best year in IBM's history followed by 2009, the best year in IBM's history, followed by 2010. So there are lots of ways to do things other than cut R&D. Um, so it's fundamental. There are no guarantees. Uh, but you need to look at what the N is in R&D. And you have to innovate for decades and for generations, much less for a century. It needs to be done. And you have to be able to turn discovery into profits. It's the fundamental role of a public company. And believe me, it always doesn't pan out. I mean, not that you would remember these, but I can mention a couple. PC Junior. Uh, <laughs> hey, you do remember, right? The Luggable. <laughs> uh, OS2. Um, you know, anyway, the, the OS2 Bowl. I mean, you could really get carried away here uh, for those IBMers in the room. But, you know, but you, you, you have to kind of, you can't, you can't get disconnected between making the breakthroughs and monetizing the discovery. I mean, there's an old joke that IBM products aren't launched. They kind of escape. <laughs> they escape out of the laboratories, right? Uh, and you need both R and D, not just D. You also need to keep changing how you do both. Indeed, the classic R and the classic D are only two aspects of how value is created over decades. And innovation and the models for innovation have changed. Research today happens in many ways beyond wholly owned laboratories or national laboratories. Collaborations with universities like nanotechnology centers, in our case in Albany, New York, or work we do with Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, San Jose State, and other universities in this area are key. And collaborations among companies, even competitors like Semitech, are very important. Collaboration with government, from the Manhattan Project to DARPA, uh, which we all participate in, are very, very important. 
Development, too, is happening in ways that are increasingly more collaborative than they were in the past. From open source, in fact, John was asking me about Linus and Linux, and I told him about how IBM and Linus and I uh, stood on stage, and we made a decision to put a billion dollars behind Linux and open source because we felt they needed to be enterprise ready, and a billion dollars was enough to give a little bit of an, uh, momentum in the marketplace. And, but, but fundamentally, it led to this whole thing. You, you don't think anything of Linux anymore, right? Open source, crowdsourcing. You, know, you go back 15 years ago, a billion dollars to get it institutionalized, distribution support, cleanse the IP, all the things that had to occur, they were all part of that collaborative model. Uh, the broader point, I believe, is that a commitment to both R&D means that it's not only important to innovate, but it's also important to innovate how you innovate. Uh, it's interesting to think about this in the context of Silicon Valley. The Valley is unmatched for spawning technology innovations. And in spawning new companies and new ways to monetize those innovations, it's highly adaptive like any market. And much of that, I think, as you saw, is reflected here in the museum's permanent exhibit. But the model of serial launches, serial IPOs, and free agent nation, a model that generates enormous vitality for the Valley, I'll argue may not be sufficient, either to build lasting institutions or to support the kind of explorations in basic science that those institutions are uniquely equipped to pursue. Now, this leads me to my second thought, which is how does any organization survive, survive not from its failures, but from its successes? Again, the Valley indeed, in the history of business, is a, there's a bone pile of companies that had extraordinary initial success, organizations that made a meaningful impact on the world, but were not able to come up with Act II. And so why, you know? I think part of it is the inability to get beyond an emotional attachment to the past, to what had made those companies successful. You see many enterprises today, you see many countries today struggling with this fact. They don't know how to look farther than the past and how to understand how to break to the future. There are lots of instructive examples in IBM's history. Uh, famously, uh, in the early 1990s, we held on to the mainframe business model long after the industry and the market had changed in its ways that rendered that model obsolete. And the problem wasn't technology. I mean, remember, everybody had the mainframe as dead. Fortune had it as a dinosaur. I mean, last quarter, our mainframe business was up 50, 51%. Thank you very much. It's hardly dead. Right? So it wasn't the technology that was the problem, it was the business model, right? And when you have a healthy business model, it's really, really hard to make those changes. It's organization, it's cultural, everything's built around it. And as you're probably aware, it, was, it took a very difficult struggle to IBM to change all those things. We had to abandon all of our previous ways. We had to literally go from, and these were factually correct statements, I was the flunky working in our monk for the chairman at the time, we went from 412,000 people to 214,000 in the bottom. That's change, ladies and gentlemen. That is structural change. Uh, let me give you another example. Oh, by the way, we're back to 426,000. So there is life after a change to the business model. You know, there is life. And our margins are back to where they were in the mainframe era, you know, our pre-tax margins. So there, there is life. It just takes a lot of hard work and a willingness to change. I mean, let me give you another example. Uh, one that wasn't as financially traumatic, but I think one is very visible, the PC. I mean, we introduced the PC with Andy and Intel and Microsoft in 1981, and then the popular ThinkPad in 1992. Uh, the ThinkPad, the, our, our laptop, the mobile computer, was by any measure the most recognizable brand for IBM, and arguably the only brand we had that touched the individual. Tens of millions of people were loyal to the ThinkPad. And for all those reasons, the idea that we would divest of the PC business for many, and then pardon the pun, was unthinkable. Yet we knew, we knew that emerging computing model would accelerate the commoditization of the enterprise PC industry. And we didn't want to be there. We were mostly enterprise. We were not consumer. 
Uh, so we decided it was time for our PC business to be in better hands, and we formed a relationship with a company named Lenovo, a Chinese company that's doing very well. Uh, in the first case, you know, we had identified the entire company with uh, a particular product, a business model, the mainframe. IBM, it was the model. We couldn't imagine we could live in any other space. And we had lost sight of why IBM existed. Uh, we changed under a lot of peril. We moved to the future. In the second example, uh, we, it was a great innovation in 1981. The collaboration we had with uh, Intel and, and Microsoft was phenomenal. Phenomenal innovation in 1981. But 20 years later, it was, it was, it, it was standard. It, there was a lot of differentiation. And it was time to move to the future, and it was time to move on. So the key of those two examples is don't get wedded to your success, the business model, the mainframe, or to a technology as exciting as you might find it to be in your laboratories. Of course, it's one thing to get past emotional connection to products and technologies or business models. But I have a third one for you, ladies and gentlemen. How about outliving a charismatic leader? What if he or she is your founder? Interesting. We had a family that ran the place for probably half a century. I'm only the ninth CEO of a 100-year-old company. So we've learned not to confuse charisma with leadership. In business, there are examples where the genius of a founder created tremendous good fortune, at least in the company's opening act. The cult of personality is seductive. The press cultivates it. The street trades on it. Employees love it. They're endeared to it. They crave it. And people start believing their own press clips, unfortunately. But, but what then? How does an enterprise follow the departure of the founder or a larger-than-life CEO? Um, IBM itself faced this challenge. I mean, personality, drive, and the ethos of Tom Watson Sr. was irrepressible. His irrepressible optimism, and we used to listen to Junior on the PA system giving us an extra holiday for Christmas season when I first joined IBM, right? This was the whole world. We didn't have to wear the straw hats anymore or the velvet hats, but we still had to wear dark suits, white shirts, and military striped ties, and wingtips, and sing songs in training. But nonetheless, this dedication to excellence, superior uh, quality of every task that you did, willing to take big risk, you know, in this great statement that he, that he made, that all that he believed that the problems of the world could be settled easily if people would only think. Um, it made an indelible imprint of IBM. In fact, our research facility that we have today uh, in Yorktown is still named after the founder, Watson. And at our celebration on June 16th, 35 Watsons attended. Children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And I took them through the valuation if they had the original 100 shares of IBM in 1911. <laughs> I pointed out to the audience, there's only 35 people that can appreciate what I'm about to say. <laughs> it was significant, believe me. It was significant. Anyway, um, I think many historians believe that Tom Watson Sr.'s most enduring contribution to the business was his intentional creation of something that would outlast him. It was a shared corporate culture. He showed how the basic beliefs and values of an organization could be perpetual, and how they could be a guiding force through the constant of time. Uh, this is why we focus so much attention over the years on building talent. Betting it all on one person we think is a mistake. A small cadre of stars, we think it's a mistake. Uh, it's just the opposite of what we would view as building a long-term successful business model. Now, developing talent uh, that can lead the enterprise generation after generation, it takes money, it takes time, and it takes patience. This is not just about people at the top. It's about developing future leaders broadly and deeply throughout the organization. And this is why IBM invests hundreds of millions of dollars every year. It's why before things like the Corporate Citizens Corps, where we're sending teams all over the world in the emerging markets, all over Africa, all over other places in, in, in the Middle East, as well as in Latin America, to help them understand how to become global citizens and future leaders of a company that's operating 
in hundreds and hundreds of countries, and many of them where they're growing like crazy in the emerging markets. So by deliberately building a culture, we don't mean glorifying the routine of what the founder did. Rather, it's about institutionalizing why the organization does what it does, getting to the essential truths of what makes you, you, and building every dimension of your enterprise down to the way you do things day in and day out on those truths. Because if you aim to build a lasting institution, then there's certain things that we believe must not change. And now I like to quote Tom Watson Jr. again from that 1962 speech. 1962, I firmly believe that any organization, in order to survive and achieve success, must have a, have a sound set of beliefs on which it premises all of its policies and actions. Next, I believe that the most important single factor in corporate success is faithful adherence to those beliefs. And finally, I believe that if an organization is to meet the challenges of a changing world, it must be prepared to change everything about itself except those beliefs as it moves through its corporate life. Everything about itself except those beliefs. Tom Watson uh, really wasn't talking about ethical principles. He didn't know about Enron or Sarbanes-Oxley or any of those things. He was talking about a company's identity what made it distinct, what made it unique, what shaped its decisions and behaviors. How do you codify that? How do you sustain it in its core? How do you ensure that it endures through decade after decade, or even a century? Today you'd call it the brand value proposition, but in 1962 there weren't all these fancy marketing MBA schools at that point in time. Uh, so that's what to him was going to be the most sustainable thing. I love the thing about change everything about yourself. We wouldn't have had the mainframe business model problem if we adhered to that belief, because we were unwilling to change everything about ourselves and move to the future. So in sum, uh, uh, I would put it to you and that both the story uh, told in this, in this wonderful museum and the story of IBM's 100 years uh, have a lot to teach us about this relentless need for change in the continually evolved institutions. They both are necessary for survival but also they might not be sufficient. I also would argue that they're seeing this with new urgency at this moment in history is very, very important. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a widespread belief that simply being connected would solve all of our problems. And certainly, it's wonderful that the world has become instrumented and interconnected. Let us actually, we actually know how all these things work in real time around the world. But yet, despite that, the first decade of this century has witnessed a serious series of global system breakdowns. 9-11, the oil crisis, fears of global supply chains, and of most recent financial and housing collapses. A couple of decades ago, people also convinced themselves that deep research was no longer needed, that you could just emerge great innovation from crowds. Well, I think the past decade has reaffirmed what IBM has always believed from our point of view that today we need deep science more than ever, including ever more powerful computing and advanced analytics that can make sense of oceans of data in order to build and advance the capability that we still need, we still need today. We need serious, highly institutionalized research and we need collaborations that are multidisciplinary. And we also need something else that I was just mentioning. We need collaboration. We need collaboration between academic institutions, between business, and between governments. And I understand that today is probably more aspirational than pragmatic, but fundamentally, it is part of the solution to the future. Competition is a wonderful stimulus to innovate, but it's not sufficient. That's because we live in a world that is increasingly interconnected. Indeed, it's more and more revealing itself as a complex system of systems, where different fields of technology business and society are flowing and interconnected one upon the other. So the Wild West of competition needs to be complement, complemented with far more collaboration across old boundaries, across academic disciplines, industries, nations, and yes, even between competitors. In fact, let me close with a modest prediction. When the permanent exhibit of the Computer History Museum is revisited for your own centennial, John, nearly 100 years from now, 
I expect that the history it recounts will be far more complex, far more reflective of new kinds of collaboration, far more global, and far more multidisciplinary. Maybe we won't, we won't even call it the Computer History Museum any longer. Maybe this spot will be voted to something we'd say, the history of thinking. Thank you. That was wonderful, Sam. Thanks very much. We're going to have a little conversation now. And uh, I want to start, you know, there's something that you alluded to in your speech uh, that I want to ask you about, which is, I'm sure in this year of, of the centennial, the Watsons and the, you know, the things that you've observed that they, they said uh, earlier in the great speech from 62 are foremost. But as the, only the ninth CEO in the history of the company, before the centennial, is there, were there days when you sort of look over your shoulder and this shadow of the Watsons is kind of looming there behind you? I mean, how, is that, how does that affect being the CEO of IBM? Uh, actually, uh, actually, it's funny. There's some great things about it, and there are things that you have to understand that the world has changed. Uh, and I'll give you the, I mean, I'll, as always, I'll try to be balanced and give you both sides of the story. Um, one of the most incredible things about it was this phenomenal commitment to um, very, very progressive sets of policies, and as well as very a strong commitment, even to the early days when we opened our first research facility at Columbia University. So strong commitment to progressive policies, strong commitment to R&D. Now, what do I mean by progressive policies? I mean, 10 years before the uh, Equal Opportunity Act passed, Watson had already written a memo you know, about equal work for equal pay, and that you know, people would pressure us not to have diverse manufacturing facilities in the South. He, he'd tell the governors he just closed them. That's just how we did things, you know, right? You had this great, that's very consistent with this great line that you had in the speech a minute ago where you talked about overcoming an emotional attachment to the past. So right. let, let me ask you a question. I heard an amazing statistic from someone on your team the other day, which is that out of the 426,000 employees at IBM, about half have been with the company five years or less. That's correct, yes. So in that, in that case, and I'm sure they're hard-driving, forward-looking people, that's the way you would want them to be. Was there any ambivalence or discussion at all within the company about whether it was even appropriate to take a moment and look at IBM's history and, and not really draw their attention to, to well, that? Well, I much? think the thing was that we felt there, there are two ways to do it, right? Yes, we had this discussion. Sure. And I'll, again, I'll be, uh, give you both sides of the discussion we had internally. If we were going to give ourselves a victory lap for making it in 100 years and make it a huge party, I don't think that would have been as appropriate. However, if we use it as a learning experience internally to go around the world and teach people about what the company has been able to do, space program, Apollo 13, Gemini, et cetera, et cetera, all the fractals, Fortran, all that stuff, right, risk architectures, uh, and then get them connected to this model of innovation, we could use that as a learning exercise, as a developmental exercise. So what we did intentionally was not make it a party. Um, I mean, a lot of companies do. I mean, it's, it's, and, it, and I'm not saying it's wrong not to do that. It's, it's wonderful to celebrate 100 years. It's so rare. Uh, but at the same time, we decided that you know, it shouldn't be about a celebration of our past. It should be about teaching people what it takes to sustain it. So in a way, we use the occasion to go around the world teaching people, giving lectures, and all, and all of us, not just myself, all my direct reports, we all went around the world, universities, employees, town halls, and use it as the occasion of education. Uh, if you look at the 100 by 100 video, it's been out on YouTube, it's the same thing. It's, it's in the spirit of education as to what it takes to sustain yourself for 100 years. Uh, and it's been very, very positively received. The other thing we did, which obviously, in the spirit of celebration, we gave everybody in the world $1,000 for the IBM stock on June 16th. So, so, then, <laughs> so then you're seeing all these people. You're seeing hundreds of thousands of people around the world celebrating the centennial. What did, what did you learn? What were the surprising things you learned about IBM, its people, the attachment they have to what they're doing that maybe you was unexpected or you didn't expect to see from them? You know, I really, which you should have, I, we all should have anticipated, but I really never, um, 
with, if you think about all these people that are young and haven't been here very long, but this phenomenal emotional attachment to this entity, this brand. Um, and you know, we're, you know, I talk about it, it's in 176 countries. So you got more cultures, more language, more religions, more things you can imagine as I say that. And the fact that there was this incredible emotional attachment that came out uh, associated with this to me was sort of surprising. It met, the example of it, which I was absolutely blown away, I mean, this I mean, blew me away even after my 38 years here. We asked our people on June 15th, the day before the centennial, go give back. Because we thought IBM always stood for doing things for others, whether it's innovation, progressive policies, whatever. So we want you to go, we just asked them to go give back their time. You might find there are 300,000, actually more, but we say more than 300,000 people, 317,000 people. They had 5,000 projects, 2.7 million hours of community service in one day around the world. I mean, I, I mean we said this thing out there, maybe 30 or 40,000 people would participate. 300,000 people across the world did a day of community services. And anything that was important to them, and if it required the foundation to participate in, in a financial sense, uh, the IBM Foundation did. But it, uh, to me, is this connection Again, back to the population being so new to the company, but this, uh, the pride and then the importance of participation in community, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked by. I mean, um, when we rolled up the numbers the next day, I just couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. You just can't imagine the reaction you'd get that people would take their time that are working very, very hard in today's environment and go give back. Hmm. There's a talk among companies out here about about what it means to be in Silicon Valley, what it mm. means to be innovative and, and have the kind of culture that, that exists here. And then there you are on the East Coast, as IBM has always been, although you, you know, certainly have a presence out here. What are the differences? And is there anything that you're, you try to think about out here and incorporate and vice versa? Oh, no, we learn a ton from what goes on out here. In fact, this morning, uh, I did a, a session with a room full of VCs in the Valley. Uh, the room was packed, right? So I can't tell you how many, it was like standing room only. Um, but, and we, we work constantly with them and we learn a lot, we collaborate a lot. They see things we don't see or they'll see things through a different lens than we might see it, you know, right? Uh, they're part of our work that our research team does called the GTO, which is a 10 year outlook on technology. And they come in once a year and then we have a big fight between the businesses and the technology guys as to where they think things will go. And so we learn a ton. Uh, from the community out here, there's phenomenal innovation. Uh, in the past 10 years, I guess someone pointed out this morning that we, their number, we had acquired 116 companies. Actually, I think it's more than that, but we'll go with the number. And that 62 came from uh, this part of the world, this ecosystem, uh, through the relationships we had established. Some large, some small, you know, right? Uh, but fundamentally, so there's a lot to be learned. I think the the point that I'm on is, and we tease about East Coast, West Coast, but it's a point of collaboration, and I can, I can then take you through India, China as well, you know, as to the same kinds of things we'll do from that perspective. But what you really need today is you need, uh, our view anyway, you need lots of points of views uh, when it comes to technology and innovation. And you can't be wedded to your own, and you can be, become very insular and self-absorbed and we have a huge research organization, but you can, get, you can get too wound up in that. You know, you need these counterbalances. You need to test things that uh, we'd say, well, okay, let's take the China, we do what's called China in, Indian in. So if we were Chinese, how would we view it? If we were Indian, how would we view it? If we were VC, how would we view it? And, you know, uh, we actually run this as a formal process. Uh, and I guess my own personal belief is we're better because of it. We are better because we can participate with all the people out here that are phenomenally innovative and have great business models and terrific ideas. Do you find yourself now in a bigger competition for talent because of this global change than you've been before? Um, it's always a struggle, you know, right? Uh, so you have to create a value proposition that people find attractive. We don't struggle with PhDs or double E's or all the very, very advanced degrees, you know, right? Uh, because one of the things that the value proposition you know, think of it, I was with Almaden today, and it's a happy place. It's Brilliant people. I mean, they are convinced they're going to do that. I mean, they're convinced. In 10 years, we're going to have a computer, literally, 
a supercomputer in a shoebox, big as a human brain. And, and they might be able to do that. They already have a chip acting like a worm. I don't know if they're going to act like I mean, you know. <laughs> Eddie's laughing. It's a little way for a worm to a brain, but we got a worm anyway. So, um, so <laughs> he's giggling. But so, you know, but um, you got to let him run. But I don't know if I'm going to give him as much money as he wants. But you got to let him run. Uh, Watson, we gave him $10 million to get started. Whoever knew it would end up beating and winning Jeopardy. We gave him $10 million to get going. Did you have the same reaction to Watson, by the way, when someone said, we're going to play Jeopardy with a supercomputer? Oh, my, no, my re here's how Watson came about, um, which is, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is a true story. Uh, my colleagues have heard it before, but I go to research occasionally, and I'll say to the guys, show me stuff, this is like in 05 and 06, show me stuff that you think has got the biggest impact on IBM in the world, in, in business world, and society. And so you see raw research. I mean, it's raw. I mean, today I'm watching things that actually can target a bacteria in the human body that you know, will be available literally like next year, you know, how they can do it through nanotechnology. So big impact, obviously, to the life sciences industry. So they had all these equations on the wall uh, written out, and they have all this natural language, 55, language of 65 different languages, simultaneously translating TV feeds, all this stuff going on. And they say, see, we can do this. We can do big data. We can do all this stuff. We can do natural language interfaces. And this is like, you know, it's, it's research. So I, being a liberal arts guy in the room, uh, I, I say to my colleagues, I said, you know what we need? He would say, I said, we need a game. He said, nobody understands what you're talking about. And this guy, Dave Ferrucci, did it. The, the lead scientist, the project director, as we called him, who, who did it, looked up at the television show and said, you know, we can do that. We can win on Jeopardy. They hadn't written one line of code yet, you know, right? <laughs> but they're going to win on Jeopardy, the Grand Masters. And anyway, that's how it all came about. And, and that now, if you go through the transformation that's going to happen, you'll see it next year on the physician's assistant, where you can actually do diagnoses in like seconds or minutes versus days and lots of tests and all those sorts of things. And it's right like 99% of the time, obviously working with a doctor, not with a layperson. Uh, you'll see it in financial services and those kinds of places. It'll be, it'll be productized in a couple industries next year. So, so that's sort of the, the backdrop of how all that came about. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it does demonstrate, I think, really to the world what, what we mean by big data and deep analytics. And the interface is natural language. It doesn't have to be, but it happens to be natural language. Uh, I, it's been a huge lift to the IBM brand. Mm. So let me ask you one final question. Mm. Um, you joined IBM in 1973, yeah. so you're not, you're not quite 40 years into it, but you can see that from here. What has right. this year meant, this centennial year, to, uh, and your personal calendar of years at IBM? Is it, has it been what you expected or more? Or well, less, I or? actually, uh, you know, other than the fact that um, we, all of us, not just myself, but the senior team, including our board, have been going around trying to ex express to people what lessons we've learned through this. In fact, the ad was a four-page ad. Andy was wonderful. He sent me a great note uh, about his reaction to the ad. We were talking about it earlier. And I said to him, and it was Andy's not known for hyperbole. I mean, if you know Andy grows reputation. Uh, he tells you whatever's on his mind, and you, you, know, you react to that one way or the other. But it's always sincere and constructive. Uh, and it was a wonderful note, and I think it sums it all up about how, you know, we told the story in balance, the good and the bad and the lessons learned, and he got, and he read all four pages of the ad. I took it to my senior staff, and I said, you know, some of us know Andy really well. Many of you don't even know Andy. The younger people, you know, don't remember the relationship we had in the Intel and in the early PC days and didn't have that experience. And so I said, this is really, really, if to get this kind of a response, so what we're trying to accomplish to explain that the lessons learned of 100 years is, is pretty, pretty phenomenal. I think, you know, Andy, thank you again publicly for that. I also think it sort of sums up, uh, to me, the surprise of, of a lot of the reaction, which is people are, uh, obviously they're curious. They want to know how can it possibly be. There's a lot of intellectual, sincere curiosity. Uh, but when you have that sincere, constructive conversation and you watch the reaction to what a company has meant, right, it just makes you the, I'd say, the luckiest guy in the world. 
I mean, I just happen to be the lucky guy who happens to be here at the centennial. Okay. There, you know, there's, there's been nine, there'll be a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, right? Uh, I happen to be the guy that was fortunate enough to have been here and, and watched the reaction to, to this to, from a global society's perspective. And I've, you know, I've, been, in the, I've been everywhere. I, I mean, I can't, you know, I won't, I won't bore you with my travel log. But it's phenomenal to watch the reaction to uh, people who probably, you know, five years ago had no experience with IBM, but now have had significant experience, like in Sub-Saharan Africa or even places in China and places like that to watch the reaction. It, 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 it'll blow you away. Uh, it's really incredible. The other side of it, uh, not to sound old, but it also establishes, I think, a burden of responsibility for the future generations of the company. Because the Watsons created this phenomenal legacy, right? And the people that are going to run the place well after me, and I'll be long dead and gone. I mean, they have that burden to be able to continue that same level of success. And uh, I think they also have that responsibility. And as I uh, remind my colleagues every day, and I remind myself, uh, it's not about you. We're temporal. Ten years is a long run, but it has nothing to do with that. It's a, it's a temporal thing. It's a point in time. It's about the hundred years, and that when we go, you know, the, the 14 or 15 folks that make up the, my direct reports, will it be better than we found it when we got there? And then the next, the young people that are sitting here tonight, I'll, there's, there's somebody around the room there, some of them are sitting on the left-hand side. When it's your turn, will you leave it better than the people that left it to you. Uh, that is what I call a, quite, quite a burden. Uh, you know, and it's, and it's more, I mean, everybody wants to talk about the numbers. Yeah, everything's a record these days. They have been for the past couple of years. We're off to another record everything this year. If you look at the financial statements. But, but my only point is that uh, it's much more than the financial statements. It's much more the return on equity, return on capital, and all those sorts of things we dwell on. It's really about an entity's ability to recreate itself over and over again and do it in a way that it contributes, not do it in a way that was self-serving into itself. But it wasn't about go invent something, do a fast IPO, flip it, restructure it, pop it, redo it. Yeah, I mean, why? You know, what, you know, now, now I'm going to sound really old, but if you look back and all you did was IPO, flip, stuff, restructure, refinance, reflip, re whatever, sell yourself once, sell yourself twice, sell yourself three times. Did you really cre I mean, create a phenomenal amount of wealth? And good for you, that's wonderful. But what did you leave behind? What did you create of sustainable value? Go through this museum, what artifacts of yours are downstairs? Right? There's a test for you. Right? There's a test. How much of that stuff is downstairs? You know, I was asking, where are those guys? Where are those guys? Where is it? So use that as a, a balance to the measurement, in my view. Add that to the discussion, other than just short-term wealth creation. Put the balance in there, and then use that as the measuring stick. One person's point of view. We have the gift for you. <laughs> oh, I think that says it all. all right, right. We have a gift for you. This is we have a brilliant young photographer named Mark Richards who's okay. taken. He he looks at a computer and sees art. So this book is called Core Memory. There's a lot of IBM wow. in it. So please take this as a little memorial of your time with us tonight, Sam. And please cool. know how much we appreciate you being here and taking the time. It's just been great to have you here. So well, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.